Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 109. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. And Scott, once again, we gather together with two guests to talk about le future, as the French call uh, it. The future, that's right. Le future, uh, el future. La futura. <laughs> right, all those things. And we, we do not discriminate, Tom. Any language, come, on, come one, come all. It's your future, too. Uh, let's do this. I'm excited. Joining us today, uh, founder and features editor at Vox's new gaming site, Mr. Russ Pitts. How's it going, Russ? It's going very well, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Russ is filling in at the last minute uh, for our another guest who, who had to cancel unavoidably at the last minute, so we're happy to have Russ with us. Also joining us, showing up, Miriam Joar, senior mobile editor at Engadget. Welcome, Miriam. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Let's get uh, right in with the first prediction from one of our listeners. This comes from Mike in Australia. He says, hi, guys. My prediction is that in 10 to 20 years, we will all have the ability to be telepathic. Well, not that we could read each other's minds, but in the sense that we could communicate to others using only our minds and some technology. I believe that there is technology being developed now that will allow us to control things by thinking only. Couple this with the ability to use a smartphone to dial, etc., just by thinking. Fast forward a few years when the tech is smart enough to interpret thoughts of words and conversation. And finally, the ability to have the device safely implanted into the human body. There you have it. Telepathic humans. And then after he had finished writing this, he found a link to a University of Utah study uh, where they are working on just this very thing of being able to control a computer with just your thoughts. I was going to say, this is actually, this showed up in the news, the local news here uh, in Salt Lake City, talking about this very study. So it's all very exciting. Everybody's freaking out up there. Um, and, you know, you bring it up on the show, Tom, sometimes about this constant prediction we get from listeners that we'll one day have chips in our brain and they'll somehow interface with us and we'll have heads up displays and all the all the kind of, you know, different predictions that we've had in this in this sort of vein of thinking. And nobody's ever quite put it that simply, which is, it isn't like we need to have something that lets me control you and say, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for and then have you repeat that back to me. All we really want out of this tech or, or where we really want to get to is really just basic, simple stuff like, did I set my alarm this morning for six? No? Well, then I'm, let me just think it's set, and then it's set, and we're done. And we don't have to worry about, you know, the alarm not going off at six. And maybe that alarm's built into the chip. I don't know. But I, I like where he's headed. It's a simpler approach, a more, uh, I guess, practical approach, a little less sci-fi, robots are taking over approach. And that's it's kind of refreshing, to be honest. We don't want robots to take over? What? <laughs> are you pro-robot? Well, yeah, I'm pro-robot. <laughs> Well, Miriam, you're also a mobile editor. You're, you're always looking at phones. He yeah. uh, mentions, Mike mentions in this email about, uh, you know, dialing your smartphone. Will we even need a smartphone in this case? Will we just have something implanted? Well, I'd like, I mean, I'm all for the implants too. I, I think, look, the, the way I see this is my biggest gripe right now with computers is that I'm thinking faster than I can act. So if we can somehow this do this telepathic thing where we actually are able to Think a sentence and it shows up in the editor or something rather than like, you know, type it with five typos and get frustrated because you realize you did the typos. By the time you're at the end of your sentence, you lost your train of thought because your fingers can't keep up. That happens to me all the time. So, you know, well, in, I, in theory, you could you could do that in a, in a situation, say, like surgery. Let's say you've got a surgeon who's, you know, I don't know, he's got the most important surgical job ever and steadiness of hand is everything. You know, maybe this could augment his ability to steady his hand. And like if he's got beat? even... 
Go ahead. Go like ahead. A, like a biofeedback loop, but instead of a physical sure. biofeedback loop, it's a brain. Like you're using your hands, but it comp- when you see that you're making a mistake, it actually instantly takes your brain input to give you some server control override of what your hands are doing to get you in the right sure. direction kind of thing. Sure, yeah. or pump, pump or release the right chemical at the right time that steadies the hand or whatever it is that, that is needed for the body to do the thing it needs to do. And that would have all kinds of far-reaching applications. But the idea that you could... Just you could you could be the world's greatest surgeon, you know, well into your 80s because yeah. this thing is compensating. You know, you still have the raw skill, the desire, the passion, the whatever to be this great surgeon. But then you've got this other thing that's just sort of making it, you know, last longer, making you more impactful for longer. I think that's that's a cool application of this idea. To go back to your question about phones, I think uh, for me, phones are not phones. They're computers in my pocket. I don't, I got into phones because there were computers I could carry finally, like a, a unified media device, as it were. So um, that's where I'm excited, not because I can make phone calls and do text messages. That's a complete obsolete concept. I think asynchronous communications is the way to go. I think that if you want synchronous communication, just meet in person. Uh, sometimes that's obviously not possible, which is why we're doing Skype today. And you know, there are some intended reasons for these technologies, but I think the concept of making a phone call is inherently flawed. So I think there are much better ways to communicate for the kind of intent that people have when they make a phone call 90% of the time. Well, you combine phones with this kind of technology and all of a sudden uh, you you don't have to make a phone call. You don't have to right. dial a smartphone. You just think out onto the Internet. Russ, what do you, are, you, are you cool with that? Yeah, you know, I think Me just I think, thinking you up when I want to chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if, if I want to show up every time, you know, you, you think about me. I'm not sure if I want to get that deep into your mind. But I think there's definitely something to be said for uh, this kind of telepathic communication technology. I mean, if you look at where technology comes from, is a constant push and pull between the technologists who just want raw power and then the consumers who want convenience. And anytime that raw power intersects with the convenience, that's where you get your you know, your breakout technology, your big sort of your iPads and such. Uh, I have often thought that if I could just think, I would get a lot more done. Uh, that's the convenience factor. So once the power of the technology catches up to that, I, I think there's going to be some awesome stuff coming down the pipe. Yeah, I want yeah, we'll, we'll to be able to just just think my writing onto the page. I yeah. won't even yeah. be a page anymore. I could just think it right into the think verse or whatever it is where people are consuming content. Well, it's interesting you say that because in my case, it's like, all right, I need, you know, a big part of what I do is illustration. And and that's such a brain to hand to paper sort of, you know, thing. That's the that's that's the whole thing. So the idea that I could just sort of think that stuff through some sort of tablet that would just sort of draw it before my eyes. Do we lose something there? I don't know. Like some would argue that we would, that we're that we're losing something in the loss of the tactile, um, you know, motor function of it. And you're, I guess you're, you're probably now dealing with a case where everybody can draw. Because if you can tap into that kind of you know, power in your brain, it's, most people know what they want to see. They just can't get it out of their body through their hand or through their, you know, how, they, how they sort of translate thought to hand. So maybe artists go away. Maybe everybody can draw now and then there's no point. So nobody draws. I don't, I don't know. know. I think we definitely do lose something in the tactile. I mean, you know, there's something to be said for remembering things because you've written it down. You actually written yourself a note instead of just typed it or spoken it. But, you know, I've heard this argument, too, that once everyone can type on the Internet, that community forums are going to be the end of quality writing on the Internet, right? Because once you have an account where you can put something up on the Internet, suddenly you're a writer and then, then writers will all die. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. So yeah. I, I think there's still I think there's still some hope uh, for the artisans of the world even after I can think a, you know a cartoon it will probably still not be as good or creative as your cartoon. How about what would you what would you say about the idea of gaming and being completely mind controlled? Like the thought of, of going and picking up or downloading a brand new game. Here's your sixty bucks. Uh, it's I don't know some it's it's Modern Warfare twenty five, and you're controlling it with your head. Do we lose something yeah. in that tactile? Like we're already kind of losing some of that as, as things like Connect and other technologies come our way. Um, not that we're being for, force fed those and we don't have to use them necessarily for the games we want to play. But if there comes a day where it's all through your mind, do we lose something in losing buttons and analog sticks? And oh, yeah. Stuff? Oh, yeah. You know, I was at a coffee shop, my coffee shop around the corner yesterday, and I saw a kid play an iPad in portrait mode. And I don't know the game. Uh, 
I have no idea actually, but it looked like an old arcade type game emulator. And the bottom one third of the screen was dedicated to a joystick equivalent, like the kind you used to see in arcades with the big red buttons and the, sure. the, literally the, the stick with a bread ball on it. And he was emulating that. And I did a double take because I'm like, is he holding an actual controller with these? Because it was so well rendered. They looked to me like the angle from which I looked at. They looked like a real controller. What if it and was then the when Atari I it's just, app? Yeah, maybe. I mean, all I realized all of a sudden it's just an iPad, and I'm like, this kid has probably never touched an arcade cabinet. And I'm like, what a shame, right? Because <laughs> the, the one thing we lose about this, <laughs> this you know, this glass interface, right, is we lose. We lose the tactile feedback. We lose the whole concept of actual 3D objects. Somebody wrote a really exciting blog post about this a while ago. I'm going to see if I can find it and email it to you guys for the recorded version of this. But it's all about the losing the tactile feedback and the three-dimensionality with these 2D interfaces on glass. And I think that's, that's a shame. But I also do think that there's a kind of a trade-off here, right? Like you get to a certain level of convenience by having this kind of simplified interface or virtual interface but it, it as long as people still go out there and do stuff like they go and and they still tinker with their old car and change the tire and change the oil and and they go out there and they still travel and and do sports i think we're going to be all right but i think there are some times when we're going to lose out on some of that tactile feedback by having these thought interfaces these touch interfaces I think the biggest thing you lose with with gaming once you can think into a video game is is all touch with the real world, right? I mean, it's as games have progressed, we've seen that the simpler the interface becomes, the broader the audience uh, correspondingly becomes. And the problem with the motion uh, sense technology like the Wii and the Kinect uh, and, and Sony's PlayStation Move is that it's tiring to do those actions with your hand. And it's not as much fun because eventually you just get tired and you don't want to play anymore. So when you can think into that, you know, that's that's when it gets into scary, uh, I don't ever want to leave territory. Uh, and, you know, I can see that happening. And it, it happens now with games that you still have to use a keyboard and a mouse to play and people get very lost in those experiences. Uh, once you can think it, even more so. Good topic, Mike from Australia. Thanks for, for sending it in. You, too, can send in your prediction, and we will uh, possibly read it on the show. Send it to forecastpodcast at gmail.com or post it up at forecastpodcast.com. Okay, we're going to get to our guest predictions in just a moment. want to thank our sponsor, Netflix.com, purveyors of fine streaming video wherever bits are delivered via transport protocols into your device. Uh, that could be an iPad. It could be a smartphone. It could be an Xbox. It could be a Wii. It could be a PlayStation. Uh, all kinds of devices have access to Netflix. If you would like to try it for free, if you're like, I've heard of this Netflix, how can I try it? Try it for free right now. Netflix.com slash twit. They just launched their first original show, Lily Hammer, starring Stephen Van Zandt. You can watch that. Plenty of other television shows. Plenty of other movies. Go check it out for free or tell a friend if you've already got it, netflix.com slash twit. We thank them for their support of Forecast. All right, Russ Pitts, we start with you. Uh, your predictions, uh, or you can choose to pass to Miriam. Oh, oh. Your call. Well, you know, we were, uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Big right. money. No whammies. Right. No whammies. Uh we actually sort of touched on it because my prediction, you know, as a student of media, uh, I've been working in, in, in various media, media, this is all I've ever done. So it's all I uh, think about. The, where I see us going in the future is the, is the barriers between the, the us and the media, the entertainment, whatever it happens to be, are slowly eroding. Um, you know, I have some younger nieces and nephews. They uh, spend way more time with their electronic devices than even I did. And I remember I spent more time with my electronic mm -hmm. devices than was healthy. Uh, and they're constantly consuming media. And, you know, your, your, your sponsor for today is, is a perfect example of that. Wow. I'm on that Netflix service constantly on a variety of different devices. And I think the more technology advances to where it removes our barriers between us and that content, you know, whether it's telepathic control or whether it's retinal based displays or whether it's you know neural links to, to shove that stuff straight into our brain uh, the the harder it's going to be for us to separate ourselves from that technology I think in the far future people are going to look back at at 
at this period in, in time I'm describing, which is not too far from now, uh, in horror. They'll be horrified at how uh, easy it was for all of us to get sucked into our entertainment. So, Ross, uh, Russ, if you, if you, I'm trying to think how to word this right. So, do you, um, not to throw too much of a social ball into the game here, which isn't even a saying, but I'll Keep go ahead your and social say it anyway. balls to yourself, Scott. <laughs> Um, what, what, what do you, what do you say about the idea that not only are we going to thin the barriers between us and the actual entertainment or content, which I agree with hundred percent. And I think that's just going to get thinner and thinner, but also that our access or our distance between those who produce it, act in it, uh, um, you know, provide it, what, whatever, whatever their title is that, that, that distance is also narrowing. In other words, we're going to we're going to start to see people have more access or more, I guess, direct communication and social interaction with with the people who make this stuff, not just the content itself. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to ask? Abs- absolutely. And, and, and mm. by way of answering that, let me let me throw something out to you. Um, I'm currently sitting at a desk, just a standard desk that I use for my workplace, uh, and I have three cameras pointing at me with three microphones. Uh, and the top shows on television are all feature normal people doing uh, either ordinary or strange stuff or relatively normal stuff, right? So what we're, what we're creating uh, with our sort of uh, love of this technology and entertainment is, is a scenario where we are, we are the entertainment. Uh, and, it's, and it's happening right now. You look at uh, Facebook and Twitter and the rise of the social networks, that is content generated by normal human beings doing normal human being stuff. And I think the barrier between, you know, with each generation, the barrier between what we consider appropriate to do in front of others has, has eroded. Spent some time on YouTube. Um, mm. I think we will get to the point where practically everything one does in daily life is uh, broadcast in some way, shape or form and becomes the entertainment. So not only in terms of consuming the content are the barriers eroding, but uh, in how the content is created, uh, that is changing radically as well. Barry, Barry what, what's what do you yeah what do you say about this uh, the thinning of the of the line on the and because of devices you cover every day on Engadget? Yeah, I mean there is. I think that the, the trick here is that there's this danger, right, of of disconnecting from the real world. I mean it's just easy to stay at home with your phone and tweet and uh, Facebook status updates and Gmail. I mean G what I G plus and stuff. But I, I think that anybody who you know, lives life in a relatively fulfilled way, will quickly realize that it's so much nicer to get together with your friend at the coffee shop and talk or to uh, travel, to actually get on an airplane, go to the Grand Canyon and have a look in person. And and I think that uh, once people are reminded on an occasional basis of this, they'll be awed by it such that they will do it maybe less often. But when they actually do it, they'll really enjoy it. So I'm not necessarily sure it's it's a bad thing. I think it's like everything else. You know, I, I believe that the pendulum can swing one way, but it's probably going to come back a little bit with um, a bit more moderation. I mean, clearly, um, having access to global communication the way we have today, where I can pick up any of these devices I have and video call, call, text, uh, make a video, picture, send any kind of information to anyone in the world pretty much anywhere, anytime, is very liberating. It's, it's made things significantly better, I think, overall. But I also think that, you know, when you use it to the extent that I do, you, you start quickly realizing that you do need to do other stuff, um, like face-to-face stuff. And we always it always comes up on this show this idea of blowback from whatever height of technology we reach the idea that it seems really awesome we get there we kind of like it and then there's a lot of people who are like whoa you know and it happens now I mean I've I know people who still refuse to use Facebook because they believe that Facebook is single handedly responsible for making people less personal and I know people who say you know video games do the same thing or whatever there's always going to be some percentage of people that that push back and say, well, no, wait, I, I prefer my relationships to be flesh and blood and at the coffee shop every time. And I, I just don't believe in, you know, any of this technology bringing me closer to anybody through any kind of quote unquote social network. I feel like it's, it's, it, it takes a big, something really big to happen in this way, like a big sort of, I don't know, a big shift or a big paradigm shift in the way that we communicate for people to, in a, in a really large number to sort of, do a lot of pushback and go away from it. 
Um, but we've had predictions on here, Tom, like, um, I'm trying to think of some of my favorites. Like, there would be uh, religions set up that would, uh, religious-like organizations that would be set up that would be all about the old way of doing things. And the old way being, you know, I don't know, typewriters or TVs with knobs on them <laughs> or or whatever. And that they would they would almost become cultic in a way as they sort of worship the old ways of doing things. While the rest of us are walking around with implants and heads-up displays, they're still, you know, cooking on stoves and you know, watching reruns of Welcome Back Cotter on a crappy old black and white TV. Yeah, it always it always <laughs> seems like whenever there's a new advance, we want to immediately rush to say it will entirely replace the thing that came before. And the fact right. of the matter is, mo that's actually fairly rare that that happens. Uh, when recorded music came along, people thought that was the death of concerts. But people go to concerts in larger numbers than ever before at stadiums yeah. because yeah. it's an experience that they can't get. The other way. And, and, and when we came up with plastics, uh, it's not like we stopped making wooden furniture because we realized there's a different quality to it. So we want that. But I, I think, Russ, you know, what, what you're saying is our distinctions of things are going to go away. We're not going to be thinking of it as that provides entertainment to me and I consume it. That whole relationship changes to where consuming media is is living your life, is going out to the cafe and, and going to the Grand Canyon. That all becomes a continuum of entertainment. Is that, am I taking it too far? Yeah, no, I think, I think you're exactly on the right page there. I mean, you know, there's, there's been this fear of newness, no matter what the new thing is. I mean, novels were going to erode the fabric of society, you know, when they, and they absolutely first came out. Have. And they have, because, you know, <laughs> yes, they've exactly. corrupt us all. Look yeah. at us all. Women, instead of, you know, keeping house and, and maintaining order for their, the men in their lives would suddenly lose themselves in these. Well, in and these look what happened with the lower, the lower classes. I mean, forget, yeah. <laughs> you know. We no I'm longer have a ruling aristocracy, or do we? Well, ex exactly. Well, exactly. Well, I think we still do. It's just taken on a different shape, but yeah. I think that's a different podcast entirely. But uh, yeah, ex exactly what I was trying to say is that it's not so much that, you know, there will be this culture shock, although I think there probably will be, and I hope there will be, but the barriers between what is entertainment and what is not entertainment, what is my life and what is television, those are going away, and then it's going away uh, – it's going away whether we want them to or not, frankly, and it's going away faster than I think uh, anyone will ultimately be comfortable with, except for the children who grew up, uh, you know, in that environment. Yeah, I think that like everything else, it's kind of like this this feedback loop thing where we we swing one way too far and we come back in the middle and find something that works, for, you know, for the majority, as it were. I mean, some of us are always going to be more tech savvy. Some of us are going to be adopting these things earlier. I can see all that, but I think that, um, as you said, you know, wood furniture still exists. Uh, people still get on airplanes to have business meetings halfway across the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, um, well, you know, I, I think that's inevitable. I think that as things get more advanced in a way, we, we're going to continue finding different ways of, of using the old ways. Uh, to our advantage when necessary, and of course, forge ahead. I mean, I'm I'm all for forging ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It seems it, seem, it just seems like there's no way. I mean, you're not going to stop progress, and someone's always going to have a problem with it, and and then that generation will pass, and everybody will be cool with it. But then there's another crossover where the next generation has something crazy going on. I mean, we're just talking about basic human sociology here, but I just th I just think ultimately it would be really interesting to see if we ever came to a place. Where the ubiquity, maybe it's maybe it's a singularity, maybe it isn't, but the ubiquity of of whatever technology uh, is the most advanced is now just a thing that we all live in, exist with, use constantly, and there's never issues of brand or who makes this better than the other guy. I mean, in, in essence, a world where Engadget doesn't have a job, which sounds terrible right now, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, you know, you're no longer yeah. having to review these things because those things are some big collective thing that we just except as part of well, the fabric of human life. I think the key there is that Miriam has a job, but there is no need for a surrounding publication, possibly. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't really care because I'm a developer, ultimately. That's what I've been doing before I did uh, tech journalism. I love doing tech journalism. It's fun. I get to play with gadgets and travel, and I'm very passionate about it. But I'm basically passionate about technology. So as long as it's something interesting to do, I'll find it. But the thing is, I think you're... Is maybe I don't know if that'll ever happen. I mean, you look at cars, right? Cars are a hundred years old, and we're still reviewing them. We're still getting excited about them. 
And and you'd think by now it'd be so commoditized. I mean, the Prius is like the toaster of cars. You know, it's like an appliance. You get in, you almost <laughs> press a button, you get to the other end, right? It's like almost if they could put you to sleep, it'd be a portal, right? And it kind of does put you to sleep. I mean, from a driver involvement point of view. I mean, honestly, that's how I, I, I'm 43 and I look at people who learn to drive today uh, on hybrids or electric cars. They don't even know, you know, they're, they're like, why would you even have a transmission? This makes no sense. And, and it's like, yeah, I get it. Technically, I totally see where they're coming from. But driving a car with a transmission that you have to shift yourself is a completely different experience than getting into an appliance car, right? And the, right. the question is, what works for you, right? I mean, I th- there are some things I'm really set kind of in my old ways about. I like, I like taking things apart and breaking them and rebuilding them. And I think that that's never going to go away. As long as there's tech out there, we're going to continue – uh, some people are going to continue wanting to hack and tinker and make, you know. Yeah. And and I think that's why we still have people collecting car from cars from the 30s and 40s and 60s, right? Because even though they're technically not really that meaningful anymore, they don't really make much sense. They they have a very unique experience. I mean, it's like you get in an old car, you know, it has a certain smell, it has a certain feel. And that, that's something very, very different than the brand new car you just bought from the showroom, right? So I think the same goes with tech. Like I like pulling out old computers from time to time just for the hell of it because it's like, wow, this is a very different experience. Yeah, it's just, it's just I, fun to live, to live in the way that that tech used to make you live. So right. Yeah. And I mean, every right. time in history, some major technology has happened. Some people have refused to adopt. Like you were giving the example of Facebook before, but, you know, like the Amish are still, you know, trying, you know, sure. refusing to adopt some stuff. Like some people are still refusing to use computers in the Internet, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, you know, that's that's the, actually the wonderful thing about people is that we all have a different approach in a different way. And if that works for them. So be it. You know, I, I personally, I'm forging ahead with the robots and the implants. That's just what, that's what I'm saying. You know, so <laughs> implant you know, a you robot can, in me now. You know, you I can knew she was pro robot. I knew ride, it. Or you can stay behind. You come with me or not. You know, is the way right, I see right. it. Right. All right, Russ. Any last uh, additions to your prediction before we uh, hand it over to Miriam? No, I think we I think we covered this well. I mean, I'll just say I I I, I look forward to this time. Uh, you know, I think it will be bad in some ways and good in some ways. Obviously, producing media is my business, so the more of it, uh, the better. But I, I will still vacation by hiking in the mountains and and getting in touch with nature. I will still vacation <laughs> on a tablet. All right, let's move on <laughs> to Miriam's predictions. Um, uh, Miriam, what do you got for us today? Uh, prediction, prediction, prediction. Let's see. Um, I'm more of a near future prediction. Kind all right. Of person. That's good. You know, we like that. I, I, I like to, uh, you know, it's all these cyberpunk novels I read when I was a kid. It's all kind of happening, really. Um, but, but it's interesting to me that if you look generally in a very kind of unfocused way at the world from 20 years ago to today, very little has really changed. You still have houses that look the same, cars that mostly look the same, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the small nitty gritty details, like you don't pull out a map anymore. You pull out your smartphone. You don't go to the bank teller. You use an ATM or even better. You don't even go to an ATM. You use Square or something. I mean, this is where, um, you know, I like to make these kind of little predictions. Um, One of the ones I think that to me is the most important and significant is we're going to get to a point where – uh, this is my hope. I don't know if it's going to happen, but but I'm hoping that people can make this happen. Where wireless is everywhere, super fast, super cheap, ubiquitous. Like basically, ubiquitous computing is is kind of where I'm I'm thinking we should go next. I think that the PCs have gotten really cheap to the point where you can buy a netbook for 200 bucks or a tablet for less than 200 bucks even now and get online. The problem is the getting online part is still kind of expensive. Um, you're going to say, well, there are some options, libraries, blah, blah, blah. But overall, a lot of people don't have that access. So what I'd like to see is a completely like, you know, 7-Eleven blister pack level of computing access. You mm. just walk into the store, you find a blister pack tablet for $10, you buy it. Uh, it has wireless. It's included in the price. It breaks down after a year. It's made of biodegradable stuff. 
doesn't matter because it's a dumb terminal anyway. You're going to connect to some cloud services and that's that. That's kind of what I'm seeing happening at some point soon. It's all about mean, costs coming down, right? Like it's just the prices right. have got to get drop, and, and then immediately somebody's going to grab onto that and make that a commodi you know, a commoditized thing. It's not even right. a word, and I'm excited about it. But I love this <laughs> idea of being able to walk in there and go, "All right, give me, I want an eight by twelve freaking internet slab, thank you." And they and they give you that and your Slurpee. You walk out. You got it. You got it. That's awesome. And it's yeah. like it's like you lost yours. You dropped it. You didn't. You you need another one because you left it at home. Whatever. And it's like it becomes commoditized, like post-it notes, you know, or pens. You're like, can I borrow your pen? And somebody just hands you a tablet, you know, and you're like, okay, cool. Ah, I always you. lose my tablets when I let people borrow them. You know. <laughs> you got to write I your name on the back. tablets everywhere. <laughs> you just etch it with a big knife. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> no, but seriously, look, I think that doesn't mean there's no room. Like, I don't want people to misunderstand. I still think there's room for you to buy a tablet that will last you five, uh, you know, like uh, five years is ridiculous, technologically speaking. But like a yeah, right. year or something, you know, um, that is well made, that feels premium, that is, you know, I'm not suggesting that it goes away. I'm not suggesting it even goes away to buy something ridiculously expensive and because you, the materials. But I think as you were saying before, ultimately, the ground zero experience will be the same. Technology will get so good that the ten dollar tablet will be decent enough for you to use, and then you know the hundred dollar tablet. It'll all be about look and feel and touch and and the way um, you know basically the options. You know, kind of like today, you buy a car today, a new car. It doesn't matter what brand model you buy of a new car today. You're pretty much guaranteed you won't get stranded on the side of the road for the next three years, right? Yeah, it's true. That's true for the most I mean, part. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, issue, right? Yeah. Um, I remember paying for, uh, so in high school, I paid 200 bucks for a Mercury Maverick, okay? Biggest piece of crap ever. I paid $200 for it. The car was less than nine years old when I bought it. It was already pigeon-toed, stuff coming out of the hood all the time. It was a piece of crap. I had to fill the tire on my way to school every day. It was horrible, but it was, you know, high school, I had 200 bucks, whatever. That was my car. Um, now, if you go, if a kid goes and buys a car that's 10 years old, they buy a car that was built in, you know, 2002, that is not an old car and is not anywhere near end of life and is not anywhere near having those problems, assuming somebody took relative care of it. Um, we've gotten, you're, you're not wrong, we've gotten really good at making this stuff work well, work for a long time. You know, some of the old, the old uh, stereotypes just don't exist anymore. Ah, it's an American car with a piece of crap. It doesn't really exist anymore. They're all pretty good. And this idea that, you know, we could get to a space where, or a place where technology was just no longer this thing that felt like a premium device. The only way you could get it is if you go to the big store and spend way too much money and do a monthly plan or buy it online and hope the 500 bucks doesn't bounce your account or whatever. I would love to see a day when that, I mean, that that's kind of when we do start to see ourselves drift into a society where the ubiquity of, of technology is just like breathing air. It's just everywhere around us and we're just using it as we need it. And we're not thinking about, whoa, it's huge investment this year on a new computer. You're just thinking, let me borrow that for a minute or here, have mine. I've got three or whatever. I, I, I love your future. I hope I have it sooner than later. <laughs> and, and I think going Is that your Maverick right there, Scott? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a, it <laughs> oh, took the gas wow. in the back. Underneath, you flipped up the, the uh -huh. stupid license plate thing and put the gas in like that. It was terrible. Did Peace it come with this crap. lady? No, the lady came. You had to pay <laughs> that was optional. Okay. I only had 200. She was you know, another 100. This, is, this was my first car in high school. Oh, you're kidding. Not kidding. Oh, wow. dude, it was what? my sister's car, and I bought it for $200 from her. Oh, uh, you're weirding me out. That's, that's weird. I know. <laughs> that we're, is we're creepy. Like, it's the future. Yeah, yeah think, and the past. Yeah. I think we're marking <laughs> our age here, all of us. Yeah, yeah a little bit. bit huh? But, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying, the other thing I can see happening is um, just every everyday life things. You know how right now you, you buy, if you buy like a... An, a timer for your kitchen, right? Like a, a digital timer for $3 or like a, a, a disposable. Nobody buys disposable watches anymore. But if you buy some sort of disposable electronic, the microchip inside is kind of like a commodity microchip, right? And it has very basic abilities to drive an LCD display and maybe take, you know, it's basically like an like a even even simpler than Arduino microcontroller, right? But imagine a future where that that kind of level of ubiquity of computing, those microchips are like dirt cheap and they have built in wireless and they have built in things that we take for, you know, we only take for granted on higher end devices today. So now you could have almost anything in your house that has a microchip, you know, be online in some way. So uh, not online, but on the network. 
So you can do things like, oh, did I leave the, did I turn on the washing machine? And you did because you know, because you just turn it on from from wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. Right. And so I think this, this level of, 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 of ubiquity comes with this kind of idea as well, where you don't even think about it anymore. It's like, you know, of course it brings in all kinds of security and privacy implications, but again, I think that these, these are solvable. It's just a matter of how greedy do we want to be and, and how, uh, you know, I, I tend to have a very kind of utopian approach that that dictates that we're all going to be uh, respectful of one another and going forward. And, and I'm hoping that maybe we can teach people to behave that way so that, you know, privacy and security become less of an issue. And also, I'm sure that software will improve t- such that, you know, it'll be less of an issue. So, now Russ, this plays right into your prediction. This idea of ubiquity of access, not just of gadgets, but of connectivity as well, allows for you to be creating and distributing media everywhere you go. Yeah, and I think that's a key part of uh, of any kind of sort of ubiquity of, of entertainment or, or technology or anything. It definitely goes hand in hand. I mean, we're seeing that now. The technology is being pushed as a means to interface with the entertainment more often than not. I mean, the iPads are huge. Uh, those iPads are huge right now and tablets in general are huge right now. And they're huge in part because they're entertainment consumption devices uh, and not simply uh, smaller computers or more mobile computers or, or, or you know, accurate web browsers or Wi-Fi you can carry with you. Uh, it's, it's about providing access to the things that people want. Uh, and if you look at, you know, I think the, the blister pack technology is a, is a, is a perfectly plausible future and, and a perfectly uh, imminent one. Uh, looking at the at the course that the, the cell phones followed, uh, you can buy a cell phone now. You, you know, I was in a, a a very cheap dollar store, and I'm not going to uh, even go into why, but there was a whole shelf of phones you could buy for five dollars, and you can pick up a phone for five dollars and start talking on it. Uh, and this blew my mind. You know, I remember getting a cell phone being such a huge deal and it cost so much money and it was such an amazing thing and, and it had to be you know shipped over and it was it was a hassle in a way but it was also awesome so you know going from that and in, in a span of, of five or ten years to where you can literally pick one off of a shelf in a dollar store um, tells me that this is coming with tablets this is coming with computers this is coming with whatever is next uh, and I think you know it, it will contribute you know, just just as as technology does in general, it will contribute both to art and creativity and thinking and the power of inter- of knowledge, uh, in so- to society. In other words, in all of those great ways, uh, and it will contribute to society in, in bad ways too. Uh, you know, with the, the entertainment and the gaming and 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 you know things that uh, that, that are that are you know fun and entertaining in, in short spurts, but it can be constructive and destructive to people. Uh, you know, if it becomes a lifestyle, it becomes a habit, it becomes something you do at, at, at the expense of, of living your life. So it's in moderation, I think, would be my would be my uh, recommendation there. You know, it doesn't come in blister packs are handcrafted, specially created four questions, Scott. Tom, you're not wrong. It's four questions. Four questions is what we do on this show each and every week. That means we're going to ask our guests each four questions rapid fire style. They are not allowed to think too hard about it. They must be answers from the gut and the first thing that comes to their mind. I will be asking Miriam her questions. Are you ready for your questions? I am ready. Go for it. All right, here we go. Number one, electronic communication is the future, or excuse me, in the future. Which do you prefer? Oh, man, we talked about a lot of this already. Chip in your head or mind-reading device in your pocket? Chip in my head. Brilliant. That's exactly where it should be. If you could invent one household item that does not currently exist, what would it be? Replicator or 3D printer. Perfect. You're good at this. Uh, number three, what famous historical figure would you most like... Or, sorry, let me start that over. What famous historical figure would most likely be using Facebook if he were here today, he or she? Uh, George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Great communicator. Yeah. yeah, Poke, Thomas uh, Jefferson. <laughs> they, they would so each MySpace. other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was literally yeah. the first name that came to mind, guys. <laughs> that's good. No, that's good. That's exactly. Thinking. I'm just you're, like you're Poke. playing the game the right way. I love it. Yeah, you're doing it right. Uh, last question: When fruit becomes self-aware and wrestles power from the humans, which fruit do you hope it is? Cantaloupe. <laughs> oh, yum. Except the kind coming out of Colorado still has listeria. Tom, I welcome our cantaloupe over to overlords. You. 
Yeah. <laughs> and <they're laughs> sweet, sweet innards. Uh, don't eat the rulers. All right. Uh, let's start with you, Russ Pitts. Four questions. Are you sitting comfortably? Oh, you bet. Good. Then we'll begin. Question number one. Let's get it out of the way right off the top. When will cats take over the planet? It's already <laughs> happening now. So we're fooling ourselves if we think that we, yeah. Okay. No, Fair they enough. own the internet. They own the living room. They own everything. Let me rephrase. How long have cats ruled the planet? <laughs> How long have there been cat videos? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, question number two. Describe what you think the first person to leave our solar system will be like. Kind of a jerk, you know? <laughs> we'll kick them out. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it takes a lot of sort of dedication uh, uh, to, to get to that level of astronautness where you're going to be the one guy they pick. I think he's going to be kind of full of himself. He's going to be kind of a jerk. Yeah. It, it, it almost have to be. You're right. Yeah. Uh, question number three, what will kill humanity first? Wow, that's, a, that's open-ended? Yeah, open-ended. Uh, it could be, you know, yeah. algae or climate change or... Virus. No. It's, virus. It's going to be some virus of, of some kind. Zombie Absolutely. virus? Totally. Yeah. Well, I hope so, because yeah. at least then you got a fighting chance. And well, I mean, unless you get the zombie virus. Yeah. Right. Well, true. Question number four: What kind of pet has the best chance of bringing about world peace? <sighs> ferrets. Sentient ferrets. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love a ferret? I mean, I think there's going to be a sentient ferret who will. It can only. It may even be just one word, but will speak, and the world will listen. Yeah. And I hope that word is cheese. Who amongst you? Could stay mad at a ferret who said cheese. <laughs> I asked nobody. You. Yeah, nobody. Who nobody. Amongst no. us. Yeah, I'm trying to digest the question. Well, I'm speaking to the audience in general. Uh, Would any? <laughs> could any of you stay mad at a ferret that said cheese? I think not. No. 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 Yeah. No. Not possible. And that concludes four questions. Thank you, Russ Pitts. You're very welcome. Thank you, sir. And that concludes our show, Scott Johnson. Uh, Miriam, thanks so much for joining us. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to be here. Let folks know where they can find you online and all about what you do at Engadget. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for having me. It was a blast. Um, so I'm Miriam Joir. I'm the senior mobile editor in Engadget. You can find me on Tank Girl at, at Tank Girl without the vowels, T-N-K-G-R-L. That's correct. And uh, about me slash uh, Tank Girl. And of course, uh, just go to Engadget. You'll see me posting on a pretty regular basis over there. Um, yeah, thanks. And Russ Pitts, thank you as well. Uh, features editor, Vox Gaming. Uh, let folks know about that project and where they can keep up on when it's going to launch. Absolutely, yeah. I'm currently in the process of uh, helping build a uh, game site to rule all game sites over at Vox Media with seven of the uh, seven other of the most talented people working in games right now. You can follow what's happening there at, at on Twitter at Vox Games. Uh, all the announcements, all the news. You can follow me on Twitter at Russ Pitts uh, or about me slash Russ Pitts, uh, and that's all of my infos. I really thought you were going to say with seven of nine. <laughs> I, was, I was like, wow. That's we tried to get seven of nine because that would be, you know, the trifecta. We tried to get seven of nine, but I think she was busy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Jared had another show or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Scott was, Johnson. A downer. Yeah. 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 So Scott, that's when they called me, I think. Really? So you're eight of nine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Scott Johnson, thank you again for uh, co-hosting as every week. Any news to let the folks know about? Oh, I would just uh, point there. If you like movies, and we talked about Netflix today. If you like movies, you like movies that are on Netflix. This Friday, uh, the show we have on the network called Film Sack, where we cover movies from yesteryear. Uh, 1989's Tango and Cash is going wow. to be our film this week. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. We were actually had this plan two other times to keep yanking it and then re-adding it to Netflix, forgetting it sort of while the iron is hot. And uh, can't wait to bring that episode to people. Uh, more information about when that goes live if you follow me on Twitter, at Scott Johnson. And uh, looking forward to Friday. It's going to be awesome. And thank what, you, Tom. Great show today. What, more, what better commentary is there on the sad nature of licensing in the film industry when Tango and Cash <laughs> can't stay up on Netflix? <laughs> I know it's a really weird, and it's also strange because there's other f better movies that are on there just like permanently. Yeah, right. But Tango and Cash is up and down, up and down. I don't know what deal they got going, but 
Well, I Something don't know. Somebody's bidding that. a little more. Better pull it off Netflix. <laughs> that 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 alone blows my theory of media uh, <laughs> permanence. <laughs> Undermines everything you said. Yeah. yeah. Don't forget to leave comments at our website, forecastpodcast.com, or send us an email to forecastpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. We'll see you in the future. I know. Only 32 years away. Nice. Wait, 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 wait. I thought that music was going to last longer. I was just getting my groove. Wait, 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 wait. That's what we do. We just long, just long enough to get your groove. That is it. That is the show. Thank you, Miriam. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.